Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Go On webinar series. My name is Michael Aquafreda and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. I'll be moderating today's webinar. The webinar has four sponsoring organizations. First, Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And finally, last but not least, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to Go On, it is a collaborative international network designed to detect and understand the drivers of ocean acidification and the resulting impacts on marine ecosystems. Go On serves as a platform for acquiring and exchanging data and knowledge necessary for optimizing modeling studies. And Go On provides key inputs to communities, industries, and governments, as well as global organizations who are seeking to develop action plans, best practices, and mitigation and adapt adaptation strategies to address ocean acidification impacts. Go One has over 800 members from over 105 countries. We are glad to have over 70 people joining us today. And if anyone is not currently a member of Go One, we encourage you to join our community. During today's presentation, all participants are in listen-only mode. You are welcome to type any questions into the questions box, which can be found at the bottom of your control panel on the right-hand side of the screen. We do ask that you specify the speaker you're directing your question to. We'll be monitoring incoming questions and we'll pose them to our speakers during the question and answer section, which will begin immediately after this presentation. We also encourage you to post questions and share insights on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and on Twitter using the hashtag GoOnWS. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available through the Go On web, uh, the Go On YouTube channel. At this time, I'd like to introduce today's three presenters. Dr. David Long is an associate professor of chemistry at Flathead Valley Community College in Montana, USA. David's areas of interest are undergraduate research at the community colleges and innovative innovative technologies for improving community science programs. William Partis is an electrical engineer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, USA. While studying engineering at Flathead Valley Community College, he and Dr. Long together built the FITER, a low-cost alternative for measuring oceanographic pH. William continued his, his education at Montana State University, graduating with a BS in electrical engineering. And before working as technical staff at Woods Hole, he worked with sunburst sensors. Finally, Kalina Grab is a PhD candidate of chemical oceanography at the Joint Graduate Program of MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Her main research focus is on extracellular reactive oxygen species uh, and their dynamics associated with corals and the implication of coral health. She enjoys combining her research interests with conservation and outreach in order to spread ocean awareness and education to the next generation. She has used the fighter as a tool while conducting outreach with high school and undergraduate scholars. With that, I will uh, give power to William to uh, start sharing his presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm David Long. I'm uh, linked in through an audio link only, so it, it will be a little bit clunky here, but um, that's all we could do given some constraints we have. So. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm an associate professor of chemistry at a community college in Montana. And I think what we have to offer today is an example of um, how we get citizens and community members involved in projects, for example, uh, monitoring ocean acidification from an inland community college that has no history of doing this. And we built a really strong sort of following of folks who are um, interested in participating in uh, citizen science programs to monitor ocean water chemistry, including pH. So uh, next slide, please. Um, this is uh, a scene that our uh, undergraduates have regular access to in the summer. It's only about 
um, around 30 miles from our campus. So we have about 1,200 full-time students. We have uh, non-traditional students, beginning uh, high school students, a very wide range of folks. But they had a really strong connection to their place. Um, most of them do, at least. And they're used to these overwhelming sort of visceral experiences of being outside and, and you know, on the surface of our planet. So to interest these types of citizens in monitoring something like ocean water chemistry, you can't take a traditional approach. And some of the approaches that we've developed and that we are continuing to develop, we feel would be pretty useful for folks around the world who are interested in recruiting uh, citizen scientists to monitoring ocean water chemistry. So next slide, please. This is, um, of course, the figure on the, on the front of the text. And if you take a beginning undergraduate and you show them these data and you explain to them how important they are and the implications here, it really falls flat when they're used to seeing the previous scene. So we kind of specialize in taking students who are just at the very beginning of their scientific careers and moving them up through the pipeline. And that, uh, again, is uh, the patterns and the processes and the methods that we've developed are generally useful for um, uh, uh, interesting a wide range of, of uh, citizen scientists as well. Uh, next slide, please. What we do is take our beginning students uh, to Morea. We take them uh, to Gump Station on the island of Morea run by UC Berkeley. And before they arrive, they spend about a year developing research projects, developing their own methodologies and their own approaches. In the previous slide, the data that we showed there that you're all so familiar with, I can show them that data, but it's another thing saying, here's some data that some scientists have collected. Now let's go and collect our own and verify for ourselves. And even using our own instruments, our own student built instruments, let's see if we can verify whether this phenomenon of ocean acidification is actually happening. That's a really powerful way to get people involved. And so next slide, please, is uh, UC Berkeley runs this um, uh, Gump Research Station on Morea, and it's an NSF LTER. And so we go there with instruments, as I said, that students have built um, projects that they've designed and put them in the same type of intense environments that they're used to experiencing here in Montana. If we go to the next slide, titration. This is the traditional way of, of interesting interest, uh, growing interest in undergraduates in chemistry. And it doesn't work for most students. It worked for those of us who are chemists and we have it in our blood and we were sort of born to do this stuff. But titration, titrating sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid is not a riveting experience. And if this is what students start out with, it doesn't typically grow interest. Uh, next slide, please. This is William uh, taking a different approach. In the foreground, you see a laptop computer. The laptop is running a SAMI PH, a desktop uh, SAMI PH instrument that was donated to our program by uh, Sunburst sensors. And in the background, you see three small silver instruments. Those are fighters. And what he's doing here, he's in the field, he's on Morea, and he's comparing measurements made by the SAMI PH instrument and his three little handheld instruments that we call the fighter. And so what he's done is built his own instrument to make those observations that are in that data slide that, that is, again, is on the front of the textbook, his textbook. So he's trying to make those same measurements and he's doing it with an instrument he has built himself. Next slide, please. Behind him is this scene. And so the, the, the totality of this experience is over the top for somebody who's spent essentially their entire life in Montana in an inland mountain state. And part of our motivation here is the idea that 
if only coastal populations are involved in thinking and doing something about changes in ocean water chemistry, then we're really missing an opportunity. Inland populations have to be involved in this. So just because we're in Montana doesn't mean that we have to sit by the wayside and maybe restrict, for example, our studies to Glacier National Park. We want to be involved and we are involved. Next slide, please. This is uh, the fighter instrument. And what it is, is uh, you see 3D printed parts here. This is a very early version of the instrument. And it's, a, it's an instrument that you run with your phone. Um, you measure salinity separately, type that into an app that you see on the right here, measure a background, and below the background green button, you see a history of measurements made by this particular instrument. Up in the upper right-hand corner of the app screenshot, you see a link where the data can be uploaded by, by any of the sort of conventional means that you're all, all familiar with. It's a really fun instrument to use. It's essentially a an, uh, an, uh, spectrophotometer, or at least a photometer, that's built at a much reduced price point, uh, works beautifully, and uh, William will show some of the data, and I'll show a little bit. But what, what William did is uh, take my call to, look, I need an instrument so students can make the observation themselves, can you build one? And he did. Um, and it turns out to be extremely useful for citizen science programs. We believe that some of the things we do with our students are things that we all have to do as citizens to interest them in uh, being involved in this. And so uh, absolutely, we have to recognize um, accurate, uh, accurately recognize talent. I'm sorry, William, we should be on the next slide. Um, this is essential elements here. Um, we've got to accurately recognize talent. We don't require prerequisite knowledge. Um, if you're taking budding students or, or citizens, and you require them to do the heavy lifting of science prior to being excited about it, that's not necessarily the best tactic in our view. So faculty at a community college are there to serve their students in a way that is a luxury I have that perhaps research personnel do not have. Um, identifying an emotional connection to science is a really important element. And this can be grown, nurtured, and it will blossom in certain people. And those are the folks we want to recruit. Um, somewhat unexplainable why some of us just um, are, are thrilled with, with with certain aspects of science and engineering and not others, but that's a really important element to identify in students. And to make a connection with their feelings in the science is really, really important. So again, I think this is relevant in this webinar because these things are what we need to do to recruit more citizens to be involved in, in monitoring, um, coastal monitoring at least. If we go to the next slide, this is a, a summary. Uh, this slide summarizes how effective the fighter can be. And um, so we've got plotted pH here in an aquarium in the lab. And the blue triangles are a SAMI pH instrument running in the lab. The green circles are a spectrophotometer, an ocean optics benchtop little single beam thing that I think you're all familiar with, which is in your kits actually that you distribute. And then finally, the red uh, squares are fighter data. And William's going to show you a bunch more of these types of measurements. But the upshot is that the handheld fighter, which is uh, cost maybe three, two, two or three hundred dollars, um, competes extremely well with, with the little benchtop spectrophotometer. Um, next slide, we have um, an illustration of how dramatically this can impact, in this case, um, one of my classes in French Polynesia, the icons that you see, see distributed across the reef are pH measurements that students um, made in the field. And um, what the instrument is good for is uh, 
spatial mapping of pH at small scales. And this, of course, is a very difficult task for a, a logging instrument, which is not designed to do that kind of thing. So it's got potential, we believe, to make a really big impact on, uh, on uh, ocean acidification monitoring, um, both in terms of education and in terms of actually generating data sets that will make a difference. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is William. He's in the he's in the medium that he's interested in studying. And um, I'll just summarize by saying that growing determination and desire in our citizens to be involved is one of the very key one of the very key things we need to do. And if they don't have the equipment to make their own observations, that growing that interest is very difficult. Um, so uh, we are really excited about the potential the fighter has to help do that. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a rendition of the periodic table. The colored columns are elements that are commonly found and used by biology in seawater. And the heights of the columns are proportional to the abundances of the elements. And even the most, even, even an, an uninitiated chemist has seen the periodic table. They might know a little bit about it, but if you show them this and get them started off on the concept of ecological stoichiometry, we're gonna go through and we are going to measure the height of this carbon column in this water, and we're going to see if it's distorted relative to natural seawater. Um, these are things that beginning chemists can understand and become enthusiastic about. But next slide, please. They've got to be just dumped right in, um, and they've got to be given the opportunity to do real work and hard work. And um, if we give this opportunity to citizens around the world and we give them the tools to do it, I believe that they'll step up to the plate and, and really enjoy and make serious contributions. Next slide, please. We need to foster relationships between people and their environment. And if they can't make their own observations and contribute to databases, I'm not sure how easily we're able to make that connection. So with that, I'll hand it over to William. Thanks, Dave. Hello, I'm William. Um, and I just want to, real quickly, it looks like we've got 93 people, if I'm analyzing this correctly. And just want to say hello. And, and I imagine a lot of you are maybe, well, some portion of you are friends and family maybe even from Montana. And I just want you to, you guys to know I miss you guys. Um, but my plan today is, uh, I wanted to start with this image here on the screen. I'm gonna shut my video off so you don't have to look at me. Um, I'm gonna start with this image here on the screen. This is a picture of me on a back reef in the Southern Pacific on an atoll called Tetiaroa. And my plan today is to kind of share the backstory of what a guy from Montana found himself doing out here. Um, and that story pretty much surrounds the, the instrument David referred to we called the fighter. So my goal today is to explain why the world might need a fighter, what the fighter is, how the fighter works, how well it works, and then, and then the, the general status of the instrument. And so first off, just a bit of background on myself. I, I currently, as was referred to earlier, am an electrical engineer at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, USA. And my primary function there is in the development of chemical sensors in service to the scientists of the institution that are studying the ocean. Um, and so this picture on the left here is an image of me and my supervisor out on one of Woods Hole Oceanographic ships, the RV Atlantis. We're working on a deep sea chemical analyzer there. It's it's leaning off the table in a pretty precarious way. Um, 
and this this is to be deployed on the submarine Alvin to study deep sea coral in the Pacific. On the right is an image of my former professional engineering experience with uh, sunburst sensors in Missoula, Montana. I'm in this image, I'm deploying one of their ISAMIs, their submersible autonomous instruments to measure pH um, off the island of Morea. And so my point here is to outline some of my relevant experience. I've, I've been around fancy, expensive autonomous sensors. Often these sensors cost on the order of thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars. The trouble with this it makes these things incredibly inaccessible to the majority of people on the planet. So, so I want to say maybe the most tragic piece of that is, is there are even people, I imagine some of them are here today. In fact, this is probably a good subsect of those people who are, who are truly interested in engaging with this problem and trying to work on understanding the problem that is our changing oceans, but can't simply because they can't afford to do so. And so the fighter is an attempt at changing that. Here's an image of the fighter. Uh, it's a it's a black box in this image. Um, it is on the order of two hundred dollars in parts. It fits in the palm of your hand. Next to it here is a, a a bottle of indicator, the the pH sensitive dye we use to take the measurement. And then on the right is a screen grab of the phone application used to operate the instrument. This controls the instrument over Bluetooth. It also time and location stamps the data. It organizes the data. It stores the data. It also allows you to share the data via Wi-Fi, cellular, Bluetooth, any way you could standard on your phone. And so how does this thing work? I, I, this is uh, one of my, I like to use the explanation of something that's maybe a little more familiar to people. So I have an image of something that uh, a lot of people may recognize on the screen here. It is a pack of litmus paper. And so what litmus paper is, as most of you probably know, is a, a paper with a pH sensitive dye on it. You take this paper, you put it in a solution, the paper changes color respective of the pH of the solution, and you can use your eyes to Look at this paper, compare it to the chart, and get an idea of the pH of that solution. Our instrument, this is a diagram of our instrument, not, not necessary to get, in, get distracted by the details of this, but it operates in a very similar way with a few distinct differences. The first being, instead of using our eyes, we use uh, sensitive, embedded optical electronics to monitor that color change. This allows us to do that with much more precision than your eyes would. Also, instead of using a dye on a paper, we use a liquid dye that we drop into our, our analyte solution, or in this case, seawater, uh, our, our liquid solution. We, so we use a liquid dye and a liquid solution and mix it up. And finally, that dye, is very precisely and analytically characterized. So we know with, with in, in a quantitative sense, very well how that dye changes with respect, how its color changes with respect to pH, as well as other parasitic variables like temperature and salinity, which we compensate for in the instrument. And so basically it, it's a little, as Dave referred to, a little pH spectrophotometer in a box. Um, and so I share this picture here. This is us in Morea on kayaks, our first trip out there, uh, taking measurements with the fighter. And I, I, I kind of want to take the liberty to say here, anyone who has developed hardware or particularly electronics, particularly electronics to go in the ocean, um, or, or scientific equipment, I think would be a bit apprehensive to hear that their equipment was maybe going out into an environment like this, wet, salty, unstable. I don't even want to refer to the personalities on the kayaks. Um, but the point here is the fighter has, and, and 
has gone into these environments and it's worked well. Um, and this is just one example. It, it, it's done it many times. So the device is durable. It can be taken into the field. Um, and so that is a key feature of the instrument. But, but so the next logical question is how well does it work? And so I, I wanted to start off, this is kind of some historical data. It's old data that I wouldn't normally show, but I, I, I thought it would be relevant because of last Tuesday's talk by Andrew Dixon. Um, and so this is, these are some measurements of the fighter with, some, with a certified reference material uh, supplied to us by Andrew Dixon. Dixon. This is a TRIS buffered solution, batch T27 to be precise. And the table here shows two sets of measurements uh, of four independent instruments. On the right-hand column, it shows the deviation between the instruments, so the inter-instrumental deviation. And on the bottom, on the left-hand side, it shows the tris buffered pH at the temperature it was measured. So this would be our calculated or expected value based on the certified reference. And on the right is the average of all the instruments measurements. And so this is exactly what you would like to see. The numbers agree very well. What is humorous to me about this image, and why I wouldn't typically show it, is that uh, you can see at this time, I really, I didn't realize yet how well this instrument worked. I didn't have the foresight to go to the third decimal place here. And I can say that it is absolutely valid to be considering thousands of a pH instrument or thousand thousands of a pH unit with this instrument. I have data to, to back that up. And, and here is that data. So let's focus first on this top image. This is an image of on the Y axis, the fighter pH compared to on the X axis, a UV viz spectrophotometer. This is a laboratory grade, uh, dual beam, laptop spec, 10 centimeter path length, water, water jacketed cell. This is the instrumentation standard for the spectrophotometric pH measurements. And this is, this is a direct uh, comparison between the two. And, and so the letters here at each point correspond to N, the number of instruments used, and K, the total number of instruments, so, or total number of measurements. So not to get caught up in the details, this just means that there were multiple instruments, and with those instruments, multiple measurements were taken. And so, so the data kind of speaks for itself. The, the fighter has a very nice one-to-one -one correlation with the benchtop instrument. There's a little more air here at the lower pH, but that's actually uh, to be expected with this type of pH chemistry. Um, but all in all, in, in, in the typical regime you would be using this instrument, we're talking on the order of thousands of a pH unit. So then this bottom part of the figure just shows the residuals of those measurements. So the difference between the UV viz and the fighter, and then also the inter-instrumental deviation which is also quite good. And so also I wanted to share with you, now that we've seen how the instrument, this is very careful measurements in the laboratory. Here's some data that was collected out in the field. In fact, this data was collected in that very same spot I showed when I started on that back reef in Tetiaroa. And so this is a diurnal cycle of pH on that reef. This is the highs and lows due to photosynthesis and respiration, uh, net ecological productivity on the reef. So it gives this really cool uh, dynamic environment to test these sensors. And so on the y-axis is pH, on the x-axis is time. The dashed line is the sunburst sensors ISAMI and the red dots are the fighter. And again, the data kind of speaks for itself good acceptance between the two instruments. I would even go as far to say as a guy who was operating these instruments in those conditions, uh, you would have a hard time justifying to me which one of these instruments is closer to the true or actual pH. Um, so really great data, really good um, example of the fighters 
operation. And so finally, I just wanted to conclude, this is a map kind of from my memory um, of all the places that we have sent fighters to be used. A lot of them, I went with it and used it. Um, some of them, they were distributed to other people, our, our NOAA collaborators or other people who had interest and we were able at the time to share them. Um, and the main detail I think necessary to frame this image, this may or may not be that impressive to somebody as a distribution of sensors. Um, but but I think the important detail to frame this here is I, I, I just by memory kind of estimated how many fighters have been made. I, I think it's on the order of like 80 instruments. And I would say of those 80 instruments, probably 90% of them were made in my bedroom. Um, so the point there is, is what I'd like to do is sit back and imagine with you guys for a moment, what would this map look like if we had a proper mechanism to manufacture and distribute these instruments? Um, and the, rea the, the honest reality of the matter is we have absolutely over the last two, three years failed to do this. And that is a large aspect of, of what we hope to accomplish here in the near future. And, and with things like engaging with, with people like you is um, developing new collaborations and ways in which we can do that. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I really, an interesting point I, I, I'm about to conclude, but I realize that idea of, of and, and I think probably most people here realize that this idea of manufacturing large numbers of instruments and distributing them present a, a, sub, a whole new subset of problems. Like uh, how are we, go what are the programs that are going to distribute these instruments and train the personnel? Who is going to manage and maintain those instruments? Um, how are you going to quality control that data? What are you going to do with that data? How will it be managed? And I agree that these are very interesting problems. I think the key point here is that the, the ability to grapple with these problems is an absolute privilege of, of the ability an absolute privilege of what the fighter is enabling. The fighter is enabling the ability to now uh, grapple with these problems of how can we create a robust global ocean acidification network. And and I just it's it is not economical nor sustainable for us to be putting hundreds of thousands of dollars or hundred thousand dollar instruments all around the globe. Now the two working in tandem could be a very interesting thing. So with that, I will stop um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Kalina who is, Kalina is gonna share an example of one of these dots. There, there are many, many experiences and we, I wanted, I, I actually had a few people queued up to share more, but we just didn't have the time. So, she, so she's gonna share, she is one of the more recent experiences going out with the fighter and so. It's off to you, Kalina. Hi, everyone. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, my name is Kalina Grab, and huge thank you to Dave and William for welcoming, welcoming me into this project. And thank you to all of you. It looks like 94 participants now for tuning in today all over the world. And of course, hello to friends and family as well as colleagues. Um, I'm going to turn off my video now to not distract from the presentation. Um, and first off, uh, as a side note, I'm participating in URGE, which stands for, um, and some of you may know, uh, Unlearning Racism in the Geosciences. In support of these efforts, I wanted to start by acknowledging the land that I work and reside in, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, in the United, in the United States, as the land of the Wampanoag tribe. So today I'm going to share a recent experience I had as a scientist and educator using the fighter for outreach education. This is hopefully one small step 
in the direction towards building a program with the fighter to fill a unique space in outreach, education, and community science around the world. First, a little bit about me. I grew up in the landlocked state of Colorado, and I was first introduced to oceanography as an undergraduate when I participated in C semester, or SEA, as shown in the photo on the left. SEA is a study abroad program that teaches high school and undergraduate students oceanography, where the students will sail aboard SEA's ships, as pictured, um, and they will get to conduct their own independent research project based on oceanography. Fast forward a few years, and I am now a PhD candidate in the MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI, joint program in the chemical oceanography discipline. For my primary PhD research, I use this novel complex sensor shown in the photo on the right. This is actually an instrument that William has helped develop here at HUI. I use this instrument to measure reactive oxygen species associated with coral to better understand coral health. Therefore, I have had extensive experience using and interacting with high-tech sensors, and I definitely recognize that such instruments are vital to push the field of oceanography forward. However, these instruments are not designed for outreach and education. On the other hand, elegant, simple to use, and cost-effective instruments such as the fighter have a very important and specific place in our field of oceanography. There is a lack of such technology that can be easily distributed and used by people around the world from different ages and backgrounds. As I will demonstrate here, the fighter has the potential to fill this gap and global communities need the fighter in order to engage with people in science and to make widespread pH measurements as William has recently alluded to. One of my main goals as a scientist is to share science with the public and the next generation to make science more accessible. Therefore, throughout the duration of my PhD, I have worked with SEA chief scientists to bring HUI scientists into their classrooms for teaching and mentoring opportunities. I have been fortunate enough to join two full semesters as a research mentor and repan. The first year, I brought aboard my high-tech chemical sensor. On the left here, you can see me teaching a class aboard the ship where I'm explaining the chemistry behind the sensor to the students and the crew. And on the right, you can see me with a group of students uh, holding my sensor as we were going out to collect some field data. While this was intriguing to the students and they enjoyed watching me collect the data that they could then use for their projects, the instrument required specialized knowledge to operate and it could not be used independently by the students. So unfortunately, I see this quite often with a lot of the scientific equipment and uh, this high-end technology holds similar restrictions to new science users. Next, yeah. Um, on my second and more recent trip with SEA this past fall, I linked up with Dave and William to receive a few fighters to implement into my teaching curriculum. I had never actually used one before. I had heard a lot about it, but even without prior knowledge specific to the fighter, I was able to lead the outreach projects based on my science background, a brief intro from William, and a few tests in the ocean. With careful consideration, I worked with the SEA chief science doctor, scientist, Dr. Heather Page and William to design lessons and outlined possible research projects with the fighter, structuring it so that the students would be able to take the most ownership over their own research. In these photos here, you can see me on the left working with a student to make the fighter measurements. And on the right is a group of students that did a independent project on the fighter and then wrote up a report and presented it to the class, which I'll mention um, a little bit later in the talk as well. A lot of these students on the trip had not made a pH measurement before, and yet after a few tries, they could use the fighter and make their own measurements and even teach their peers how to use it as well. After the trip, I asked them to fill out a user survey based on their experience with the fighter, and so I'll share some of that feedback throughout the talk today. Throughout the course of the semester, the students collected pH measurements in several different environments. Prior to sailing on the ship, the fighter enabled measurements of pH around Summerlin Key in the Florida Keys. We used it across reef transects and in the mangroves. The map on the right shows the data from 47 sampling stations throughout the mangroves, which the pair of students, which are pictured on the left in their kayak, measured in either duplicate or triplicate over the span of three hours. 
The color bar represents the pH, with the purple showing lower pH and the yellow showing higher pH. The fighter allows the students to analyze the mangrove environment, and they realize that there is a lower pH higher up in the mangroves. In the reef and mangroves, one student noted that the fighter, quote, allowed for more pH measurements in areas where we otherwise would not have been able to make them, end quote. This pair of students pictured here on the left, um, they were using the fighter in the kayak and they were so excited about it. The one student in the back talked about it for days and she kept recounting how she got to make over 100 fighter measurements and how fun it was. The fighter spurred this kind of excitement, passion and inspiration, which will likely stick with the students after the program and influence their impressions of ocean science in a positive way. On the ship, one group of students I mentioned before had an individual project that assessed their ability to make valid pH measurements when using the fighter and the benchtop spec. In the photo on the left, they are using the fighter to make these measurements. The right is a graph that the students made for their final report, and it shows the data that was all student generated, comparing the pH values from the fighter on the Y axis against the benchtop spec on the X axis for both the surface station in red and the hydrocast in blue. This is a similar comparison um, graph that William showed beforehand. However, this graph shows what the ability of new users like the students are able to do with both of these instruments. In the final report that the students wrote up, based on the standard deviations uh, that the students calculated for the fighter and the benchtop measurements, the students concluded that, quote, the fighter measurements tend to be more precise than that, those of the benchtop spectrophotometer, end quote. This indicates that in the hands of students, the fighter appears to perform better than the benchtop spec. This was most students' first time using both the fighter and the benchtop spec. Therefore, a higher precision of the fighter may be representative of a faster learning curve to obtain valid pH measurements. In addition, in addition to this project, all the students also helped collect pH measurements in lateral and depth transects. As we were sailing, they would deploy a bucket to collect data from the surface waters. A few times during the trip, we also deployed a carousel to collect water samples at different depths. In the photo on the left, this is a student using the fighter to measure the pH directly from the Niskan bottle to look at the depth profile, which is the data shown on the right. The y-axis is decreasing in depth and the x-axis is pH. The colors are three different casts at different locations and you can see that the pH profiles look very similar. These data were used in combination with other analytical measurements to help the students understand the oceanographic processes that contributed to the water column. In a post-user survey, I asked the students to rank a series of questions on a scale of one to five. One, if they strongly disagree or the lightest blue color, or five, if they strongly agree or the dark blue color. In this pie chart, it displays the answer to one of the questions, showing that most students strongly agree with the question, quote, did the use of the fighter enable you to have a better learning experience? This is just one example of the questions that we asked. And based on the other 12 questions that we inquired about, we were able to conclude that the fighter motivated the students to learn more about pH and was also easier to use than the benchtop spec. For the students, they felt confident using the fighter on their own after a few times. They also enjoyed using the fighter and they felt comfortable teaching their peers how to use the fighter. As you can see, most of the reviews confirm that the fighter is a great teaching utensil and it has potential to be implemented into community science. Dave and Williams collaborators on the West Coast have previously played a large role in the fighter outreach. And I have only had this most recent experience with the fighter, but I will continue to work with Dave, William, and their collaborators to move forward to build a platform for the fighter in community outreach. We foresee this happening in a stepwise process. First, we will get the fighter in the hands of younger generations. This will allow us to build a multi-day K through 12 curriculum and practice teaching and implementing small projects using the fighter into a PH curriculum. We will likely start this here on Cape Cod where William and I currently reside. And this will definitely have its challenges, but we believe over a few iterations, we expect to be able to refine our curriculum so that we can teach others to lead it as well. And this leads us to our next stage. 
Using Dave's ongoing program with his community college students in Montana, we will establish a curriculum that the community college students can teach and implement into local communities when they visit Tahiti on their trips. The goal here is to provide fighters to the local communities and empower the local communities to measure pH in their own ecosystems so that they can monitor their own environments. With additional iterations and careful considerations, we will work towards expanding this globally. We are interested in all of you guys, I'm sure there are many of you on this webinar now that are very qualified, and we ask for your knowledge, your input, and your potential participation. It is going to take a community of collaborations and connections to make this happen. We realize that this is a lot of work and these types of programs pose many challenges as well. But we strongly believe that the fighter will be an incredible tool that can be deployed around the world to coastal communities and used to monitor their own ecosystems. The fighter allows us to start asking questions which William already alluded to before, such as how do we incentivize these local communities to do this type of continuous monitoring? Or as he mentioned, you know, how do you QC data on this larger scale and how do you manage this data and make it so that it is useful? Imagine the power of the fighter if it can enable global communities to learn about and monitor their own ecosystems while contributing to a worldwide database of pH measurements. Thanks, Kalina. Dave, we are on the acknowledgement slide. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys. I just want to make it um, really obvious that we've benefited immensely from collaborations and, and um, it, some really wonderful people have been involved in in this project, and we've got so many up here on this acknowledgement slide that it I can't uh, mention everybody, but I would like to point out a few folks. You know, Laura Francis very early on expressed um, so she works out in the uh, Channel Islands. Um, very early expressed support for our program, and throughout um, the the couple of years we've been developing this instrument we've had nothing but um really positive input and it's it's been really humbling um and uh has really actually translated to um some real difference um so the montana space grant consortium which is a, a, a nasa funded effort in montana has funded a lot of students in my lab um, Sunburst Sensors has very generously supplied um, both expertise and um, instrumentation that we've used in our field program. So, um, yeah, we've had uh, a lot of uh, privileged relationships, and we, we really um, would hope that um, everybody's comfortable reaching out to us if they're interested in what we presented here, and so we could go to our contact information slide, and we're happy to take questions, which I cannot see from here. Thank you all so much. That was a really engaging presentation. Um, I'm going to actually uh, take control at this point, and um, we could start answering some questions. Okay, so I want to remind the audience that if you have questions, you could type them into the questions box. Um, you could also pose your questions on Twitter um, using the hashtag go on webinar series or go on WS. And then if we don't get to all the questions today, we'll continue the conversation on the ocean acidification information exchange. So I really encourage um, our audience to um, log on to the OAIE after this talk. Uh, so we actually have a lot of questions that came in, um, and I will uh, try to direct those to the specific speakers um, that they're directed to. So first question is, um, how much training is required to maintain a fighter, uh, to calibrate it, and to, um, to use it? Um, I guess that, that one is directed to William. Yeah, um, so first, I'll address the calibration thing. Actually, the 
the great thing about this spectrophotometric technique is that it, it it does not require calibration. It is a direct measurement of hydrogen ion concentration or pH. So the calibration is actually in the chemistry and the characterization of that dye. So all things supplied correctly, it requires no calibration. Um, as for the training of the use of the instrument, I think, you know, Kalina probably has more experience in this than me, but it's been my experience that we have, we have sent these to people with just a 10 minute YouTube video and relatively quickly they can become competent, but maybe I'll pass it to Kalina, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, I actually hadn't used one before and uh, you know, in the times it is now, I was actually in strict quarantine in Woods Hole and William drives by and sets up on the trunk of his car with a mask on across the street and kind of gave me like a quick 10 minute demo of how to use them and sent me, you know, how to download the app. And that was the training that I received. <laughs> um, now I've used other specs before, but this was far easier than any of those. Um, I went down with, uh, Dr. Heather Page with the chief scientist to the ocean the next day and we just made a few measurements um, right there on the seashore and after that we felt very comfortable then implementing it into our curriculum and, and teaching the students how to use it as well. So I'd say yeah it's, it's very user-friendly. That's great. Can I just can I say quickly too um, on top of all of that, I think it, with resources and more time, I think we can do better too. I have ideas. So to not, but, but without, we don't want to compromise the human aspect of the instrument. So that's one of the, I think the key features of this, that as engineers, we want to, we love the uh, automation. We think humans are flawed, but actually one of the key things we found with this instrument is bringing the human back to the equation mm -hmm. is a big deal. So. I have engineering features that I think are really cool, but I'm I'm keeping that in mind. But yeah, my, my point was I, I think we can even do better. So cool. So that kind of leads to the next question question, which is how does someone get a fighter? Um, can you buy them from Sunburst? Because um, I feel like there's probably a growing demand for a tool like this. Let's give that to Dave. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sunburst. Um, is producing a very limited number of instruments. And um, I think uh, William did allude to the fact that, wait a minute, one of our big challenges is scaling, scaling up production of the instrument. So right now we have uh, a certain number of beta testers who have instruments that were working out kinks and it still needs a little more development. And that has been going on for quite some time now. But that is one of our major challenges. How do we produce enough of these instruments that they can make the difference that we believe they can? So if you want a fighter, you should contact us directly um, and any, any of us. And you could also contact Sunburst. But the interesting thing about the fighter is it's not necessarily, there are two things about it. One is it's not, a large expensive logging instrument which is the culture of most of the scientific community so they don't easily dovetail into production of the instrument um, that's one important thing and it's not clear how much money will be made um, producing fighters yet and that presents a problem for a company that's in business sure all right, so um, another question, actually a number of people have been asking this question, is related to can the fighter be used in freshwater environments? And does the indicator dye pose a problem um, for use in the freshwater environments? That's a fun question. Um, the theoretical answer is yes. The practical answer is not yet. Okay. Um, it's something that, so a lot of th this instrumentation that was developed for Sunburst in, in their instruments that a lot of people are probably familiar with was originally developed by a chemist named Michael de Grand Prix, one of our collaborators. I'd call him a friend. 
And a lot of the work he does being in Montana is in freshwater. And him and I, when I was there at Sunburst working on this thing, had a lot of discussions on how we could maybe adapt this to do freshwater chemistry. Um, so again, the, the theoretical answer is yes. The practical answer is not yet. It would require some changes. It's actually, in a lot of ways, a lot more difficult. I won't get into the all the specifics, but it has to do with the pretty much the buffering capacity of the solution. So mm -hmm. seawater is nice because it has a much higher buffering capacity. When you add that indicator, it doesn't perturb the solution as much. In freshwater, that's much more of a problem. And there are ways to get around that, but um, we just, we're, you know, you can understand, we're still just trying to get it made for seawater. So we're, we're trying to knock the easy thing out first. But the answer is yes. And actually it goes into another interesting point. The fighter could very easily be adapted to measure other things than pH. It's actually a nice platform that could be developed to measure things like nitrate or like other chemical parameters in a relatively easy, easy way. So you could develop more uh, stuff into your program. It just so happens that circumstantially pH was the thing it started with and we're still trying to make that happen. So hopefully that answered the question. I think it did, thanks. Um, and I think we'll ask one very quick question. Um, do you need an iPhone for the app or can any smartphone be used? Yeah, so originally, the answer is yes. Originally, there was an application designed for Android, but then we found all our users, at least at that particular time, had iPhones. So we actually contracted with the help of, uh, Laura Francis was mentioned, she helped us get some funds to, to develop an iPhone app. Um, and so that's what the current, the most current version is working on. Now, I think, that's a pretty easy problem to solve. That's just a matter of funds and, and the right person to make a cross compatible application. So that's not a long term. We very much realize that a cross compatible app would be helpful and it's something we definitely see as a priority. Um, so, but as of right now, yes, the only operating application works on iPhone. Cool. Yeah, that definitely would extend the utility around uh, much of the world or developing world. Great. So uh, unfortunately, that's all the time for questions that we have. Um, but before we leave, I'd like to announce that Go On that the Go On webinar series has a new web page on the Go On website. Um, please visit this web page to view the recordings for our past webinars, including this one. Um, you also could find those on Go On's YouTube channel. That new web page also has lists of upcoming presentations. Um, speaking of which, please join a webinar, which will be on Thursday, April 8th at uh, 4 p.m. Central European time. Um, the title of that talk is, What Do You Really Need to Know to Understand Multiple Stressors? And that'll be presented by Dr. Sam DuPont, Christina McGraw, and Chris Cornwall. You could register for that webinar right now on the GoOn uh, webpage, uh, goon.org. And finally, if you're interested in being one of our webinar speakers, please sign up again at that web page uh, by going to the goon.org. Um, we're really encouraging early career scientists to sign up and share their work with the, the broad uh, goon community. Um, at Apologize for that. I think Mike must have had some technical issues. So I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank our speakers, our presenters and our audience. Thank you all very much for participating and we hope to see you all soon on the next call on webinar. Thank you everybody. Bye bye.